Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Star, Jamie, Lily, and Chloe. As always, I want to remind you to stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell, check me out on Patreon. And without further ado, let's get into this video. Up next. <laughs> Okay, we are on chapter one of, um, excuse me, not chapter one, chapter five of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I'm going to do chapters five and six today. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out. When by the glimmer of one half of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe, or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavored to form? His limbs were in proportion and I had selected his features as beautiful, beautiful, great God. His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles, and arteries beneath his hair was one of a lustrous black, and flowing his teeth of a pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes, that seemed almost of the same color as the dun-white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The different accidents of life are not so changeable as the feelings of human nature. I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life in, into an inanimate body. For this I had deprived myself of rest and health. I had desired it with an ardor that far exceeded moderation. But now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room and continued a long time traversing my bed chamber, unable to compose my mind to sleep. At length, length, lassitude succeeded in the tumult I had before endured, and I threw myself on the bed in my clothes, endeavoring to seek a few moments of forgetfulness. But it was in vain. I slept, indeed. But I was disturbed by the wildest dreams. I thought I saw Elizabeth and the bloom of health, walking in the streets of Ingolstadt, delighted and surprised. I embraced her, but as I imprinted the first kiss on her lips, they became livid with the hue of death. Her features appeared to change, and I thought that I held the corpse of my dead mother in my arms. A shroud enveloped her form, and I saw the gray worms crawling in the folds of the flannel. I started from my sleep with horror. A cold drew covered my forehead, my teeth chattered, and... Every limb became convulsed, when by the dim and yellow light of the moon, as it forced its way through the window shutters, I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created. He held up the curtain of the bed, and his eyes, if eyes they may be called, were fixed on me. His jaws opened, and he muttered some inarticulate sounds, while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. He might have spoken, but I did not hear. One hand was stretched out seemingly to detain me, but I escaped and rushed downstairs. I took refuge in the courtyard belonging to the house which I inhabited, where I remained during the rest of the night, walking up and down in the greatest agitation, listening attentively, catching and fearing each sound as if it were to announce the approach of the de 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 demoniacal corpse to which I had so miserably given life. Oh, no mortal could support the horror of that countenance. A mummy again endued with animation could not, not be so hideous as that wretch. I gazed on him while unfinished. He was ugly then, but when those muscles and joints were rendered capable of motion, it became a thing such as even Dante could not have conceived. I passed the night wretchedly. Sometimes my pulse beat so quickly and hardly that I felt the palpitation of every artery at others. I nearly sank to the ground through languor and extreme weakness. Mingled with this horror, I felt the bitterness of disappointment. Dreams that had been my food and pleasant rest for so long 
a space would now become a hell to me. And the change was so rapid, the overthrow so complete. Morning dismal and wet, at length dawned and discovered to my sleepless and aching eyes the church of Ingolstadt, its white steeple and clock, which indicated the sixth hour. The porter opened the door gates of the court, which had that night been my asylum, and I issued into the streets, pacing them with quick steps, as if I sought to avoid the wretch whom I feared every turning of the street would present to my view. I did not re return to the apartment which I inhabited, but felt impelled to hurry on, although drenched by the rain which I poured from the black and comfortless sky. I continued walking in this manner for some time, endeavoring by bodily exercise to ease the load that weighed upon my mind. I traversed the streets without any clear conception of where I was or what I was doing. My heart palpitated in the sickness of fear, and I hurried on with irregular steps, not daring to look upon me. Like one who on a lonely road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. Continuing this, I came at length opposite to the inn at which the various diligences and carriages usually stopped. Here I paused, I knew not why, but I remained some minutes with my eyes fixed on a coach that was coming towards me from the other end of the street. As it drew nearer, I observed that it was the Swiss diligence. It stopped just where I was standing, and on the door being opened, I perceived Henry Clerval, who on seeing me instantly sprung out. My dear Frankenstein, exclaimed he, how glad I am to see you. How fortunate that you should be here at the very moment of my alighting. Nothing could equal my delight on seeing Clerval. His presence brought back to my thoughts my father, Elizabeth, and all those scenes of home so dear to my recollection. I grasped his hand and in a manner forgot my horror and misfortune. I felt suddenly and for the, mo and the first time during many months calm and serene joy. I welcomed my friend, therefore, in the most cordial manner, and we walked towards my college. Clerval continued, talking for some time about our mutual friends and his own good fortune in being permitted to come to Ingolstadt. You may easily believe, said he, how great was the difficulty to persuade my father that all necessary knowledge was not comprised in the noble art of bookkeeping, and indeed, I believe, I left him incredulous to the last, for his constant answer to my unwearied entreaty, entreaties were, was the same as that of the Dutch schoolmaster and the vic, vicar of Wakefield. I have ten thousand florins a year without Greek. I eat heartily without Greek, but his affection for me at length overcame his dislike of learning, and he has permitted me to undertake a voyage of discovery to the light land of knowledge. It gives me the greatest delight to see you. But tell me how you left my father, brothers, and Elizabeth. Very well and very happy, only a little uneasy that they hear from you so sel seldom. By the by, I mean to lecture you, you a little upon their account myself. But my dear Frankenstein, continued he, stopping short and gazing full in my face, I did not before remark how very ill you appear, so thin and pale. You look as if you had been watching for several days, several nights. You have guessed right. I have lately been so deeply engaged in one occupation that I have not allowed myself sufficient rest, as you see. But I hope, I sincerely hope, that all these employments are now at an end, and that I am at length free. I trembled excessively. I could not endure to think of, and far less to allude to, the occurrences of the preceding night. I walked with a quick pace, and we soon arrived at my college. I then reflected, and the thought made me shiver, that the creature whom I had left in my apartment might still be there, alive and walking about. I dreaded to behold this monster, but I feared still more that Henry should see him, entreating him, therefore to remain a few minutes at the bottom of the stairs. I darted up towards my own room. My hand was already on the lock of the door before I recollected myself. I then paused, and a cold shivering came over me. I threw the door forcibly open as children are accustomed to do when they expect a specter to stand in waiting for them on the other side, but nothing appeared. I stepped fearfully in the apartment in, 
<clears throat> the apartment was empty, and my bedroom was also freed from its hideous guest. I could hardly believe that so great a fortune, good fortune could have befallen me. But when I became assured that my enemy had indeed fled, I clapped my hands with joy and ran down to Clerval. We ascended into my room, and the servant presently thought brought breakfast, but I was unable to contain myself. It was not joy only that possessed me. I felt my flesh tingle with excess of sensitiveness, and my pulse beat rapidly. I was unable to remain for a single instant in the same place. I jumped over the chairs, clapped my hands, and laughed aloud. Clerval at first attributed my, my unusual spirits to joy on his arrival, but when he observed me more attentively, he saw wildness in my eyes for which he could not account and my loud, unrestrained, heartless laughter frightened and astonished him. My dear Victor, cried he, what, for God's sake, is the matter? Do not laugh in that manner. How ill you are! What is the cause of all this? Do not ask me, cried I, putting my hands before my eyes, for I thought I saw the dreaded specter glide into the room. He can tell. Oh, save me, save me! I imagine that the monster sees me. I struggled furiously and fell down in a fit. Poor Clerval, what must have been his feelings, a meeting which he anticipated with such joy so strangely turned to bitterness, but I was not the witness of his grief, for I was his, for, for, uh, for, me, for I was lifeless, did not recover my senses for a long, long time. This was the commencement of a nervous fever which confined me for several months. During all that time, Henry was my only nurse. I afterwards learned that knowing my father's advanced age and unfitness for so long a journey, and how wretched my sickness could make, would make Elizabeth, I spared them this grief. By concealing the extent of my disorder, he knew that I could not have a more kind and attentive nurse than himself, and firm in the hope he felt of my recovery. He did not doubt that, instead of doing harm, he performed the kindest action that he could towards them. But I was in reality very ill, and surely nothing but the unbounded and unremitting intentions of my friend could have restored me to life. The form of the monster on whom I had bestowed existence was forever before my eyes, and I raved incessantly concerning him. Doubtless my words surprised Henry. He at first believed them to be the wanderings of my disturbed imagination, but the pertinacity with which I continually recurred to the same subject persuaded him that my disorder indeed owed its origin to some uncommon, terrible event. <clears throat> By very slow degrees, and with frequent relapses that alarmed and grieved my friend, I recovered, I remember, the first time I became capable of, of observing outward objects with any kind of pleasure. I perceived that the fallen leaves had disappeared and that the young buds were shooting forth from the trees that shaded my window. It was a divine spring, and the season contributed greatly to my convalescence. I felt also sentiments of joy and affection revive in my bosom. My gloom disappeared, and in a short time I became as cheerful as before. I was attacked by the fatal passion. Dearest Clerval, exclaimed I, how kind, how very good you are to me. This whole winter, instead of being spent in study as you promised yourself, has been consumed in my sick room. How shall I ever repay you? I feel the greatest remorse for the disappointment of which I have been the occasion. But you will forgive me. You will repay me entirely if you do not discompose yourself, but get well as fast as you can. And since you appear in such good spirits, I may speak to you on one subject, may I not? <clears throat> I trembled. One subject, what could it be? Could he allude to an object on whom I dared not even think? Compose yourself, said Clara. Clerval, who observed my change of color, I will not mention it if it agitates you, but your father and cousin would be very happy if they received a letter from you in your own handwriting. They hardly know how ill you have been and are uneasy at your long silence. Is that all, my dear Henry? How could you suppose that my first thought would not fly towards those dear, dear friends whom I love and who are so deserving of my love? If this is your present temper, my friend, you'll perhaps be glad to see a letter that has been lying here some days for you. It is from your cousin, I believe. And that's the end of chapter 5, and we're on to chapter 6. Clerval then put the following letter into my hands. 
It was for my own Elizabeth. My dearest cousin, you have been very ill, very ill, and even the constant letters of dear, kind Henry are not sufficient to reassure me on your account. You are forbidden to write, to hold a pen, yet one word from you, dear Victor, is necessary to calm our apprehensions. For a long time I have thought that each post would bring this line, and my persuasions have restrained my uncle from undertaking a journey to Ingolstadt. I have prevented his, encourage, his encountering the in inconveniences and perhaps danger, dangers of so long a journey, yet how often have I regretted not being able to perform it myself. I figure to myself that the task of attending on your sickbed has devolved on such mercenary old nurse who could never guess your wishes nor minister to them with the care and affection of your poor cousin. Yet that is over now. Clerval writes that indeed you are getting better. I eagerly hope that you will confirm this intelligence soon in your own handwriting. Get well and return to us. You will find a happy, cheerful home and friends who love you dearly. Your father's health is vigorous, and he asks but to see you. But to be assured that you are well and not a care will ever cloud his benevolent countenance. How pleased you would be to remark the improvement of our earnest. He is now sixteen and full of activity and spirit. He is desirous to be a true Swiss and to enter into foreign service, but we cannot part with him, at least until his elder brother can return to us. My uncle is not pleased with the idea of a military career in a distant country, <clears throat> but Ernest never had your powers of application. He looks upon study as an odious fetter. His time is spent in the open air, climbing the hills or rowing on the lake. I fear that he will become an idler unless we yield the point and permit him to enter on the profession which he has selected. Little alteration except the growth of our dear children has taken place since you left us. The blue lake and snow-clad mountains, they never change, and I think our placid home and our contented hearts are regulated by the same immutable laws. My trifling occupations take up the time and amuse me, and I am rewarded for any exertions by seeing none but happy, kind faces around me since you left us. But one change has taken place in our little household. Do you remember on what occasion Justine Moritz entered our family? Probably you do not. I will relate her history, therefore, in a few words. Madame Moritz, her, father, her mother was a widow with four children, of whom Justine was the third. This girl had always been the favorite of her father, but through a strange perversity her mother could not endure her, and after the death of M. Moritz treated her very ill. My aunt observed this, and whom, when Justine was twelve years of age, prevailed on her mother to allow her to live at our house. The republican institutions of our country have produced simpler and happier manners than those which prevail in the great monarchies that surround it. <clears throat> Hence, there is less distinction between the several classes of its inhabitants, and the lower orders being neither so poor nor so despised, their manners are more refined and moral. A servant in Geneva does not mean the same thing as a servant in France and England. Justine, thus received in our family, learned the duties of a servant, a condition which in our fortunate country does not include the idea of ignorance and the sacrifice of the dignity of a human being. Justine, you may remember, was a great favorite of yours, and I recollect you once remarked that if you were in, in you were in an ill humor, one glance from Justine could dissipate it. For the same t reason that Ariosto gives concerning the beauty of Angelica, she looked so frank-hearted and happy. My aunt received a great attachment for her, by which she was induced to give her an education superior to that which she had at first intended. This benefit was fully repaid. Justine was the most grateful little creature in the world. I do not mean <coughs> that she made it any professions. I never heard one pass her lips. <coughs> <coughs> but you could see by her eyes that she almost adored her protectri protectress, although her disposition was gay and in many respects inconsiderate. Yet she paid the greatest attention to every gesture of my aunt. She thought her the model of all excellence and endeavored to imitate her phraseology and manners so that even now she often reminds me of her. 
When my dearest aunt died, everyone was too much occupied in their own grief to notice poor Justine, who had attended her during her illness with the most anxious affection. Poor Justine was very ill, but other trials were reserved for her. One by one, her brothers and sister died, and her mother, with the exception of her neglected daughter, was left childless. The conscience of the woman was troubled. She began to think that the deaths of her favorite was a judgment from heaven to chastise her partiality. She was a Roman Catholic. And I believe her confessor confirmed the idea which she had conceived. Accordingly, a few months after your departure for Ingolstadt, Justine was called home by her repentant mother. Poor girl, she wept when she quitted our house. She was much altered since the death of my aunt. Grief had given softness and a winning mildness to her manners, which had before been remarkable for, viv uh, for vivacity. Nor was her residence at her mother's house of a nature to restore her gaiety. The poor woman was very facilitating in her repentance. She sometimes begged Justine to forgive her unkindness, but much oftener accused her of having caused the deaths of her brothers and sisters. Perpetual fretting at length threw Madame Moritz into a decline, which at first increased her irritability, but she is now at peace forever. She died on the first approach of cold weather at the beginning of this last winter's winter. Justine has returned to us, and I assure you I love her tenderly. She is very clever and gentle and extremely pretty. As I mentioned before, her mien and her expression continually remind me of my dear aunt. I must say also a few words to you, my dear cousin, of little darling William. I wish you could see him. He is very tall of his age, with sweet laughing blue eyes, dark eyelashes, and curling hair. When he smiles, two little dimples appear on each cheek, which are rosy with health. He has already had one or two little wives, but Louisa Byron is his favorite, a pretty little girl of five years of age. Now, dear Victor, I dare say you wish to be indulged in a little gossip concerning the good people of Geneva. The pretty Miss Mansfield has already con received the congratulatory visits on her approaching marriage with a young Englishman. John Melbourne Esquire, her ugly sister Manon, married M. de Villard, de Villard the rich banker, last autumn. Her favorite schoolfellow, Louis Manor, has uh, suffered several misfortunes since the departure of Clerval from Geneva. But he has already received his spirits and is reported to be on the point of marrying a very lively, pretty French woman, Madame Tavernier. She is a widow and much older than Manoir. I think it's Manoir. But she is a very much admired and a favorite with everybody. I have written myself into better spirits, dear cousin, but my anxiety returns upon me as I conclude. Right, dearest Victor, one line, one word will be a blessing to us. Ten thousand thanks. Henry for his kindness, his affection, and his many letters. We are sincerely grateful. Adieu, my cousin. Take care of yourself. And I entreat you right. Elizabeth Lavenza. Geneva, March 18th, 17th, whatever. Dear, dear Elizabeth, I exclaimed when I had read his letter, her letter. I will write instantly and relieve them from the anxiety they must feel. I wrote, and at this exertion greatly fatigued me, but my convalescence had commenced and proceeded regularly. In another fortnight, I was able to leave my chamber. One of my first duties on my recovery was to introduce Clerval to the several professors of the university. In doing this, I underwent a kind of rough usage, ill befitting the wounds that my mind had sustained. Ever since the fatal night, the end of my labors, and the beginning of my misfortunes, I had received a violent antipathy even to the name of natural beauty. Oh, excuse me, even to the name of natural philosophy, when I was otherwise quite restored to health, the night of a sight of a chemical instrument renew all the agony of my nervous symptoms. Henry saw this and had removed all my apparatus from my view. He had also changed my apartment, for he perceived that I acquired a dislike for the room which had pr previously been my laboratory. But these cares of Clerval were made of no avail. When I visited the professor, M. Waldman inflicted torture when he praised with kindness and warmth the astonishing progress I had made in the sciences. 
sorry about that. He soon perceived that I disliked the subject. And not guessing the real cause, he attributed my feelings to modesty and changed the subject from my improvement to the science itself with a desire, as I evidently saw, drawing me out. What could I do? He meant to please, and he tormented me. I felt as if he had placed carefully, one by one, in my view, those instruments which were to the afterwards to be afterwards used in putting me to a slow and cruel death. I writhed under his words, yet dared not exhibit the pain I felt. Clerval, whose eyes and feelings were always quick in discerning the sensations of others, declined the subject, alleging an excuse as total ignorance, and the conversation took a more general turn. I thanked my friend for my heart, but I did not speak. I saw plainly that he surprised, but he never attempted to draw my secret from me, and although I loved him with a mixture of affection and reverence that knew no bounds, yet I could never persuade myself to confide to him that event which was so often present to my recollections, recollection, but which I feared the detail to another would only press more deeply. M. Cramped was not equally docile, and my condition at that time of almost insupportable sensitiveness. His harsh, blunt encomiums gave me even more pain than the benevolent approbation of M. Waltman. D. N. the fellow, cried he. Why, M. Clerval, I assure you he has outstripped us all. Eyes, stare, if you please. But it is nevertheless true. A youngster who but a few years ago believed in a Cornelius Agrippa as firmly as in the gospel has now set himself at the head of the university, and if he is not so, not soon pulled down, we shall all be out of countenance. Ay, ay, continued he, observing my face, expressive of suffering. M. Frankenstein is modest, an excellent quality in a young man. Young men should be diffident of themselves, you know. M. Clerval, I was myself when young, but that wears out in a very short time. M. Cramp, had now commenced a eulogy on himself, which happily turned the conversation from a subject that was so annoying to me. Clerval had never sympathized in my taste for natural science, and his literary pursuits differed wholly from those which had occupied me. He came to the university with the design of making himself complete master of the Oriental languages, as thus he should open a field for the plan of life he had marked out for himself. Resolved to pursue no inglorious career, he turned his eyes towards the east as affording scope for a spirit of enterprise. The Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit languages engaged his attention, and I was easily induced to enter in this, on the same studies. Idleness had never been irksome to me, and now that I wished to fly from reflection, hated my former studies, I felt great relief in being the fellow pupil with my friend, and found not only instruction but consolation in the works of the Orientalists. I did not like him, attempt a critical knowledge of their dialects, for I did not contemplate making any other use of them than, contempor than temporary amusement. I read merely to understand their meaning, and they well repaid my labors. Their melancholy is soothing, and their joy elevating to a degree of I never experienced in studying the authors of any other country. When you read their writings, life appears to consist and a warm sun, and a garden of roses, and the smiles and frowns of a fair enemy, and the fire that consumes your own heart. How different from the manly and heroical poetry of Greece and Rome. Summer passed away in these occupations, and my return to Geneva was fixed on, in the latter end of autumn, but being delayed by several accidents, winter and snow arrived. The roads were deemed impassable, and my journey was retarded until the ensuing spring. I felt this delay very bitterly, for I longed to see my native town and my beloved friends. My return had only been delayed so long from my unwillingness to leave Clerval in a strange place before he had become acquainted with any of its inhabitants. The winter, however, was spent cheerfully, and although the spring was uncommonly late, when it came its beauty had compensated for its dilatoriness. The month of May had already commenced, and I expected a letter daily which was to fix the date of my departure when Henry proposed a pedestrian tour in the environs of Ingolstadt, that I might bid a personal farewell to the country I had so long inhabited. 
I, I acceded with pleasure to this proposition. I was fond of exercise, and Clerval had always been my favorite compa companion in the rambles of this nature that I had taken among the scenes of my native country. We passed a fortnight in these perambulations. My health and spirits had long been restored. They gained additional strength from the salubrious air I breathed, the natural incidents of our progress, and the conversation of my friend. Study had before secluded me from the intercourse of my fellow creatures and rendered my me unsocial, but Clerval called forth the better feelings of my heart. He again taught me to love the aspect of nature and the cheerful faces of children. Excellent friend, how sincerely did you love me? Endeavor to elevate my mind until it was on a level with your own. A selfish pursuit had cramped and narrowed me until your gentleness and affection warmed and opened my senses. I became the same happy creature who, a few years ago, loved and beloved by all, had no sorrow or care, but happy and animate nature and had the power of bestowing on me the most delightful sensations. A serene sky and verdant fields filled me with ecstasy. The present season was indeed divine. Flowers of spring bloomed in the hedges, while those of summer were already in bud. I was undisturbed by thoughts which during the preceding year had pressed upon me, notwithstanding my endeavors to throw them off with an invincible burden. Henry rejoiced in my gaiety and sincerely sympathized in my feelings. He exerted himself to amuse me while he impressed the sensation that filled his soul resources of his mind on this occasion were truly astonishing. His conversation was full of imagination. Very often, in imitation of the Persian and Arabic writers, he invented tales of wonderful fancy and passion. At other times, he repeated my favorable po favorite poems or drew me out into arguments which he supported with great ingenuity. We returned to our college on a Sunday afternoon. The peasants were dancing, and everyone we met appeared gay and happy. My own spirits were high. I bounded along with feelings of unbridled joy and hilarity. The end of chapter six. And we'll get into probably seven and eight tomorrow. These are short chapters, as I've said. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, the notification bell. Check me out on Patreon, Star Star Seed. And as always, please stay safe and healthy and have a great night. See you again. Thank you.